Testing one, two, three. Hello friends, welcome back. Thanks for joining me today. I am finally, finally, finally getting back to this job that I started way last week. Thought I was going to finish it way last week and then just got waylaid. <laughs> speaking of way. Um, uh, and speaking of waylaid, um, here's what I've been doing the last couple of days. I have a, sort of an exciting announcement to make. I now have over 300 images uh, loaded up on Fine Art America. So if you ever want to buy one of my paintings, if it's available, or if one of the print, prints is available, it is at Fine Art America, Dan Nelson. And uh, sorry to say, I am Dan Nelson number two, <laughs> Fine Art America. <laughs> um, I am not the one who does male nude photography. Okay, I'm, I'm, That's a different Dan Nelson. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Gee, boy. I guess I already said more about it, didn't I? I made sounds. Anyway, I am not that one. I'm the one that does painting, as you know. And uh, I've, I've worked on... Jerry and his wife worked on their faces quite a bit. Sorry, did that without your permission, not without your company. Went ahead and got that done last night. And so I am well on my way to being finished with this painting. Hey, I had an interesting, speaking of uploading um, images to Find Art America, it turned out to be quite uh, an interesting experience, experiment for me. Um, in the course of doing that, I uploaded a number of paintings that I hadn't looked at in a long time. Again, it's a bit of a surprise to me. Like, oh, wow, I forgot about that painting. Oh, I forgot about that one. Normally, and I'm sure this is not a surprise, normally I find that the, uh, you know, the older, my older paintings I don't like as well. I, I was, I'm not as good, wasn't as good. But I'm happy to say that every once in a while there's an exception to that rule. And some of my old paintings were surprisingly uh, pleasant. That was, a, that was a happy discovery. I am glad to say I'm getting better. Some more of my new paintings are better. I will start getting worried in my career when that stops being the case. <laughs> when I recent my recent stuff is not as good as my old stuff. That that'll I hope I never reach that point. My goal is to literally my goal is to improve as long as I live. Uh, one of my personal heroes in that regard is the Japanese artist from about 200 years ago named Hukusai. I forget his first name. I don't know if that, and I don't understand Japanese names. But anyway, his name is Hukusai. And you, if you are alive and breathing in the Western world, you have seen his painting. Oh, yes, you have. Hukusai painted, again, about 200 years ago, the most famous, the most reproduced painting in the world, in the whole world. And I can tell you the name of it. It's called the Big Wave or the Great Wave. Very Japanese looking. The most reproduced painting in the world. If you look, just Google it, you'll see it. Okay, so he's my inspiration because he said throughout his whole life, he said he's going to live to be 120 and that he, he was going to get better as an artist the older he lived. Well, sad to say he didn't quite make it to 120 but glad to say two things. Number one, he did make it to 95. Not bad. <laughs> and in 
And more importantly, all the critics, virtually everybody agrees that in fact he did continue to improve throughout his entire, his paintings in his, and he was an artist his whole life. His paintings in his 60s were better than his 50s, 70s, better than 80s, better than 70s. You got the idea. He did, in fact, improve his entire life, which is darn impressive. Really, really, really. Wow. So he's my hero, one of my many heroes, I'm sure. Hang on just a second. Nope, nope, nope. I'm not. That's not going to work. Uh, so my here, my my goal is to be like Kukusai. And uh, <laughs> sure, I'd like to live a long life. <laughs> uh, but 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 but, and my wife and I have commented on this so many times. Uh, man, that's not going to work either. So let me back up. I'm talking about my painting now. Um, my wife and I have commented: a long life is no big deal. Uh, it's not a great thing. Long living is not a wonderful uh, ambition. That is not. Here's, I think you all know where this is going. What is a wonderful ambition is being <laughs> um, productive into old age. That's what's productive. That's what's, that's what's beneficial. And I, I don't mean by, I, by productive, I don't mean... As long as we have our wits, we want to be alive. When we lose our wits, we, nah, take me home, mama, or whatever. Okay. <laughs> now, why was I talking about it? Oh, okay, so, 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 so I was looking at some of my old paintings because I was uploading a bunch of them to Fine Art America. I now have over, I now have 325 images on Fine Art America, so please go buy something. That is, say, buy a print of something. Um, but that's not my real point. My real point is, in the course of going through these paintings, I discovered some... I discovered what I... Looking back in a, a retrospective, I did a retrospective of my work, and I discovered that... Um, There's a certain, some of my paintings I like better than others. I, as I said, I've, I've found some su surprising treasures while I was going through my archives. And uh, the, the surprise tended to be that the paintings that were less finished were in fact the ones that I liked better. The ones, this is crazy because I preach this to my students all the time. The ones that allowed the most of the underpainting to show through, those are the ones I like the best. Wow. Now, let me see if this is, yeah, that might work. So with this lesson fresh ringing in my ears, I am going to see if I can, so to speak, practice what I just preached. I want to see if I can allow more of the underpainting. show through. Um, I'll describe that in greater detail some other time, but that's all I'm going to say about it right now. Just generally speaking, don't finish the painting quite so finishedly. <laughs> Leave more of it messy. Leave more of it messy. I 
and I was surprised by that lesson. I was surprised the degree, the extent to which that was true. Because again, it's something I'm already aware of. I'm already, I think, I'm already trying to do that. <laughs> I already think I'm trying to do that. For the last eight years, I've been in a conscious effort to be more accurate and more messy. I've, if you follow me, you've heard me say that perhaps several times. More accurate and more messy. But there it was, even more messy. Wow. Okay, so here I am. Easier said than done, by the way. That that stay, that stay, that keep it messy thing. Yeah. Everything in the, everything everything in painting is is easier said than done. By the way. <laughs> everything. It's so easy to spot out these platitudes. <laughs> it's so darn hard to, to do them. Um, let me let you see uh, this. Two figures here and one over here. And as you can probably imagine then, again, in light of what I've just been saying, I'm going to leave much of this very abstract, only a tiny bit of touches here and there and here and there. Um, finishing the painting in this shaft of light here in the middle. That's what I'm going to do. That's the plan. Now, let me... One more pass on Jerry's bar. One more... You know what's the easiest mistake for me to make when I'm doing something like this? You know what's the, the very easiest thing for me to do is misspell a word. <laughs> Same when I'm doing calligraphy. Because you're not thinking about spelling. You're thinking about curves and straight lines and curved lines and stuff like that. So <laughs> Whew. This is a little bit like calligraphy in that it's not about what the letter it's what about it's about what the letters look like not not you know what they say that I'm concerned about it's what each it's the of course I want it to look as though it's glowing glow 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 Jerry's bar Cash only. And of course, this in this case, it's neon lights, of course, so it, it really is glowing. Um, anytime that you put letters, words, letters in your painting, you have to really watch out. You have to be very careful, especially until you learn this lesson well. Do not slip into, um, do not slip into penmanship. Don't start writing on your painting because the, the unless you're a super realist, that's then sure if you're a super realist and even then you don't write, you you paint the letters super carefully. Um, this is sort of a unique situation where the, the letters are not only you know they're neon, so it's it's more important that it look look like it's glowing then Jerry's bar cash only it says here that's a joke just in case you wondered <laughs> this is not this is not a 
It's not a public bar. <laughs> this is in Jerry's basement. Okay, just about done with this, and then I'll uh, take a break and let you guys come back later and uh, watch me a little bit more. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let you watch all of it. Um, I have several photo references, for instance. This, photo, this shows these shelves here. And the first thing I'm going to do is do local color. I have hints of local color in there already. But the red, green, a lot of red and green in there. A um, little blue. I'm going to do the local color and then come back and hit spots of reflection. Same thing over there. And that's it pretty, pretty much. Just little bits of local color. Well, let me do, let me do before I go then. Let me do just a little bit and show you what that's going to look like. So let's zoom in right up here. Get this picture back down. So let's find something that's red. Okay, so the top of this bottle stands out as a very strong red item. And it's already got a hint of red here. Now, I don't know how well you can see that, um, but that's, yeah, I did not, I don't want to plaster um, red in, on, on anything. Does that make sense? I don't, I'm not going to sort of stick up my tongue and paint the barn, so to speak. I'm not going to slather on red paint. I'm letting, letting it the underpainting show through everywhere. Now that's not because of my insight this, this week, although that's been, a, and then I'll come back and do just a little touches, just a few little touches of highlight reflection. That dot there, <laughs> it's way too big, but that's all right. Dot there. It's all the dots of light that will make this stuff look like it's um, shiny glass. While you're here, I'll do one more, and that is uh, some of the green glass underneath. Just little touches of color, little touches like that, done already. And I'm going to pick up a tiny, tiny brush because I don't want to do all of my highlights uh, with a palette knife because that would become repetitious, boring, redundant. So a minute ago, I used a palette knife to do those lines. So now I'm going to use a small brush so that they have a different feel. Pick up some of that green. There, see that one bottle? That's just about finished. I might, and I might, um, looking for another sm small, small brush. I might come in here and do a few, even though it's sort of cheating, cheating my system, but that's all right. It, you know, we're not, we don't live by the system. We live visually, we paint visually. Um, so right now I'm mixing up some black by mixing up a couple chromatic, a couple transparent colors. Look at this grip, would you, holding my brush like that? Oh my goodness. Okay, so little bits of dark, just little dots. When in doubt, scratch. <laughs> Didn't let.
like that one, didn't like that one stroke. There we go. So there you go. That's that's a bottle. <laughs> that's a a finished bottle. I really want to finish one more thing, following this this old uh, familiar. I want to mix up a color of red, just slightly lighter than what's already on there, and come and hit. That's probably good. All right. So that. Hello, Chandon. Good, good, good. Hey, so I decided to bring you guys back. I haven't been painting too long without you. Um, I've, I've done a smattering of green, red, gold, brown throughout this area. And um, what I'm doing, by the way, the, the little bit of the, <laughs> the little bit of this bottle, let me turn down my monitor here. Um, the little bottle that I did here while you were watching, um, I ended up picking up a rag and, and wiping it all off. It was just, it was too much. It was too tight. It was too whatever. Um, the principle that I am following the principle that I'm following right now, very, very simple, very easy to emulate, imitate, internalize, and so forth. The principle is this. Well, the broader principle is you get dark with transparent colors, and you get light with opaque colors. Fair enough? Simple enough? Yes, it is. Okay, now, the, the entire painting was essentially as dark as it needed to be. So almost everything I've been doing, maybe everything, I can't remember, everything I'm doing in this layer is just adding light. That means adding opaque. Do you follow me? Um... Boy, how far, how far should I go down this discussion? Um, I have a video on YouTube that describes mud. What is mud? And the last two comments that I got on that video <laughs> was, was people taking me to task and disagreeing. That's perfectly fine. Um, I'm afraid I'm, I might be a little bit irritating here. Um, because someone would say, well, who taught you that? Where did you learn your definition, so to speak, of mud? And this is what's irritating is I didn't learn it from anybody. I discovered it myself. Um, I will say nobody needs to define mud. That's not the issue. Well, I mean, I'll define it for you. But the issue is you see mud on your painting, you go, ooh. That something about that doesn't look right. That's the experience. We've all had that experience. And uh, the question is, how did we how did we create that mud? Where did it come from? How did a part of our painting get muddy? And let, let me just because it has to do with what I just said, you get you you get dark with transparent colors and light with opaque colors. And mud comes from mixing those two up. In fact, specifically mud comes from getting dark with opaque colors. That's what mud is. Um, let me make one thing really as clear as I can. Some people think that Mud is a color. Now, Richard Schmid is right about this. <laughs> he's going to be wrong in a minute, but he's right. It has nothing whatsoever to do with color. In fact, I was just standing here thinking, you know, I should someday, if I have the chance, I'll, I'll throw out a challenge to my students. Say, okay, any student in the room you, right now, make up the muddiest, 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 muddiest color you can imagine you can make up on your palette right now, okay? Okay, you're done. I will take that color that you mixed up and put it on my painting and it will look beautiful and not at all muddy. 
Why? Because mud has absolutely nothing to do. It would be very easy to do, by the way, what I just said. Has nothing to do with color. The most, I'll say, god-awful, mousy, gray-brown, you just imagine the most gray-brown, gray-brown, ugly, mousy, gray-brown color you can imagine. In the right spot, that color is perfect and beautiful and glorious and almost brilliant. Most of my the colors that I finish paintings with usually are muddy colors. So it has nothing whatsoever to do with color. It's not unsaturated because every unsat every gray color of paint that you can mix up in the right context would be and is gorgeous in the right spot. So it has nothing. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself and I know I'm defending myself a little bit and I appreciate everybody giving me um, different opinions on the subject, but I've given this serious consideration and nope, I'm not going to, this is, this is correct. When you put colors on your can, no, th those other problems like uh, desaturated, super unsaturated colors, low chroma colors is what we're talking about. Colors that cannot be made intense again. Sure, there might be, you might have a problem uh, with those. You don't want to necessarily use them in the wrong place, but that's not what mud is. Mud is a color that for, there's something wrong with it. You look at it and go, something ain't right, <laughs> and you can't figure out what it is. And it's not simply the color. That has to do with trying. That, that's a result of trying to get dark using opaque color. Okay, so everything I'm putting on the canvas is light right now. That means, that means, without question, everything I'm putting on the canvas is opaque, okay? That's part of what I'm trying to say. Now, once you enter the world of opacity, once you enter the world of opaque colors, and I've said this so many times, forgive me for you regulars, but for, a, for most oil painters, they start out in opacity and never leave it. So for them, what I'm about to say applies applies to their entire painting process. No, nothing wrong with that. Okay. I mean, I don't like their process, but that's what most people paint opaque. You know, Kevin McPherson and a lot of great painters paint straight out of the tube uh, opaque. Um, so this principle applies to them the whole, their whole process. But if you're painting like me, like Rembrandt, <laughs> if you're painting like me and Rembrandt, <laughs> oh boy, I win so many friends this way. <laughs> um, if you're painting like, like me and Rembrandt, then you start out in the world of transparent and then you uh, evolve into the world of opaque. So once, whew, once you finally get in the opaque world, here's a principle. And this is what I'm doing right now, this whole time, is you put down a color, any color, any color. You put it down, and then you come back and do a slightly lighter, brighter, lighter, slightly lighter color, same, same, same color, slightly lighter shade, lighter value. For instance, I've already done it here on this green stuff right in here. But as I look at it right now, there's there's a little bit too much green, uh, similar green. That's see, that's the issue. What we don't like to see in a painting, and this this makes complete like philosophical sense, because the essence of good painting is variety, variety of stroke, variety of color, variety of values, variety of composition, so on and so on and so on and so forth. Okay, um, what we don't like is repetition. All those words, got it? We don't like to see. Those things. What we like to see is variety. Now, it's easier said than done. But see this the greens in here? There's a little bit too much sameness in all those greens. So I hope to remedy that here in just a minute. And the way you do it, the way I do it, and the way you I think you should do it, is you I'm mixing up now a lighter shade of green. And I come in and just touch here and there, here and there. It almost doesn't matter where I do it. That's, that's the crazy part. 
I touch where the green already is, a slightly lighter shade of green. Now, can you shift the chroma? Can you shift it? Yes, but I, that's called a color break. And what I'm talking about right now is a values break. Values breaks are more important than color breaks, in my opinion. So what I just did there, I just mixed up and that I'm done. I just mixed up a little bit of lighter green and came and hit all this green. Now, let's do the same thing with the reds. Now, I've already been doing this. Before I brought you back in, I was already, I was already well into this process, but let's continue it. So now I'm mi mixing up a, even a lighter shade of red. It's very, very pink, to tell you the truth. And I'm going to come in here and not, not of course, not going to cover everything. That would be a silly waste of, silly waste of effort. Just little bits here and there where the, the last shade of red was, I'm coming in and hitting slightly, the word slight is very important here, slightly lighter shades on top of it, not next to it, not adjacent to it. This is, this is again, that's something else. That would be a, a values break. That would be a big shock. This is just a little, I'm sorry, this is a values break. That would be, a, if you put this, if I put a dab of this pink, say, well, even that's red. See, I don't want to ruin my painting by demonstrating. That's a values break because that's a whole lot lighter than what's there. I'm sorry, that's a color break because it's a different color than what's there. My mind is clear. My words are fuzzy. Sorry about that. Okay, so what I am doing, again, is values. Same color, just a slightly lighter version of what's there. Okay, so it's already starting to look really sparkly. Okay, I'm going to stop that for, for a moment. Let's pick up another couple of brushes. It's just about time that I came in here and started doing some of the real sparkle, literal sparkle. Now, I use the word sparkle when I'm doing, you know, when I'm doing landscapes and anything. I use the word sparkle to describe the last... In fact, what I just described about coming back with a slightly lighter version, I often call that sparkle. But in this case, <laughs> in this painting, I, I literally mean sparkle because we're painting glass bottles. Okay, so glass bottles are full of sparkle. So let, let me do just a little bit of that for you before, uh, before I move on to the next thing. So I'm mixing up a mm, warm warm dull orange warm dull orange is that does that is, is that a color <laughs> uh, yes it is definitely a color how warm and how dull that that's the question i'm, I'm going to keep messing with it till i get it just the color i want nope i want yellower than that okay sorry this is rather boring for you i know no it's too yellow so oxide red, which is a very orange brown. Okay, there we go. So I've just mixed up a color. Here's what it looks like on my brushes. Can you see that? And um, I can only put this paint, I can't put it up here. Do you see that right there? Because I've got, this is opaque paint on my brushes register it's opaque it's got white in it and the stroke i just put down is darker than what's underneath therefore that stroke right there looks muddy not you couldn't see it it was too refined for you to pick it up but i can only put this color where where the underpainting is darker Let me go back to my important principle, very important principle, so to speak. This is a hill I will die on. <laughs> you get dark with transparent colors, like a watercolorist. I'm talking here to oil and acrylic painters. If you want some part of your... No, no, what do I mean by that? What I mean is any little area of your painting, if you want it darker, here, 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 no matter where it is, if you want this little bit darker, you make it darker by using a medium and applying a transparent color to your canvas, okay? And if you want it lighter, 
then you use white. <laughs> that, that makes sense, right? Okay, I'm going to stop, stop there. I'm not going to chase down some, some crazy, a few crazy tangents that I could chase down. I'm mixing up a darker orange brown right now for in here. What I'm essentially painting right now, by the way, is the, the wooden wall, the panel on the back side of these shelves. Okay. And I can paint anything as long as what's on the canvas already is darker than what I'm putting down. Right, right there, I just lightened that. Even though the color of my brushes is fairly dark right now, I can put it anywhere where the underpainting is darker than what's on my brushes. Again, what's on my brushes right now is fairly dark. But as long as I put this dark medium orange brown on a part of the painting that is darker than this, it looks good. If I put this color up here where it's light, it will look like mud. It will look bad. The sirens will start sounding. <laughs> the, the visual sirens in your head will start going, danger, Will Robinson. Something is wrong. Something is desperately, desperately wrong. And it is muddy color. Exactly. It has nothing to do with color. It has to do with misuse of opacity. And some, somebody might say, well, where did you learn that from? And at that point, I, I, I know I can be a little irritating because the answer is I, I didn't learn it from anybody. I figured it out. Now, I did learn a whole bunch of other things from people, like the fact that muddy color, quote unquote, has nothing to do with color. It's the miss. It, it, it's, it's on your painting and you look at it and you go, man, something's wrong with that color and I can't figure out what it is. You think it's a color, but it's not. It's the misuse of opacity anyway. Okay. Now, let me just, again, show you this principle. So I just I actually went darker there. I started with this color, then went to a darker color. So in a sense, going in reverse. Now, let's go back up to this color. What I did in here, right? I could not put any of this color up here. Why? Because this part of the painting is already, as it exists, is lighter than this color. So what I'm going to do now is mix up a lighter, brighter, whiter, lighter version of this. Again, so now it's a pale orange, not, not a very high chroma orange. You know, a dull pumpkin. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a color. And this color will look good that I'm doing right now. Will, will look good anywhere I put it as long as what's already on the canvas is darker than what I'm putting down. And of course, I can come in here and doing that other principle, which is Anytime you put down one color, it's almost always a good idea to come back with a second color slightly lighter than that first one and put it on top of. Okay, now I'm going to do that again, mixing up again. So I had dull pumpkin, <laughs> pale pumpkin on my brushes. Now I have, man, paler than that. Um, I don't even know what to call it. Pale, pale, pale peach. So I'm getting lighter and lighter, of course, because I'm getting up to this, this light source up here. And one more time, even lighter than that. Almost white now. Just a very, very See, so if I put this, now the lightest color that I've used in the last several minutes, I put it on top of the last color I put down and it looks good. Now it really does look like there is a, I can do one more thing. I'm gonna grab a clean brush. Whoops, that's not clean. 
pick up a clean brush and pick up almost, almost, always, almost pure titanium. Titanium white with a tiny bit of Naples yellow. Do you know what Naples yellow is? It's, it's like a light, very light version of yellow ochre. And I'm going to just slap this down kind of thick. Yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely thick. We like to see in pasta. We like to see that. Okay, now, now that I've got this lightest color on brush, let me put down these other two brushes for a minute. Well, at least put down one of them because I have to paint with two hands. It's the only downside about painting with two hands is you have twice as many brushes to clean. <laughs> and I hate cleaning brushes. Okay, so now I'm going to come in here and start doing bits of reflection on all these bottles. No, I, I'm not going to do this way out here and here, you understand, right? Just it's going to be focused. The light is going to be focused in the interest area of the painting. Okay, little dots of reflection. I like telling people, by the way, um, anytime I see a still life with glass, a still life, somebody's tried to paint glass, and sometimes they do a good job, <laughs> very often, okay, but <laughs> I like to tell people, okay, before you do any more still lifes with glass, just go and immerse yourself. If you can go to your local museum and see this, all the better. But even if you can't, get online and just Google Dutch still life paintings and you're going to see glass. Dutch still life paintings. Man, those, those guys, they, they figured out how to paint glass. Hey, can you see that? I know the light. Let me do, will you get better? Let me see what that looks like. Ooh, no, that's not very good either. But I hope you can I hope you can just barely make out what that's going to look like. Um, again, I'm looking at my reference quite a bit here. Oh yeah, right there. And then once in a while, come in and smear that. Now I'm not, by the way, I am, I, I am doing what the Dutch did, and I'm not doing. That. I'm not gonna. I'm not imitating their super super smooth style, right? I'm doing a modern, uh, uh, an impressionistic version. Uh, my favorite word for this style of painting is um, from David LaFell is uh, abstract realism. That's a, but I am doing m many of the principles. How do you how do you do glass? The answer is you don't paint much. You don't paint the glass. All you do is paint the reflection hitting the glass. That's a pretty good description. Got it? How do you paint glass? The answer is you don't. You just paint the light hitting the glass. Unless it's a dirty glass, of course. And who wants to paint a dirty glass? Really? Really? Okay, so that shelf might be all finished. Might be all finished. Ah, let me show you a quick trick before we go. Anytime you want something to look like it's really glowing, I've got a fan brush now. That stroke went up. I smeared the paint. Now I'm coming back with another layer, another load, if you will, of white and this time gonna go this way you can't do that slowly scary as it is you can't do it slowly or it will look like it now since I've gone that far I'm gonna give it the that would work better if that color were whiter <laughs> okay let me scrape that off <laughs> that was bad that was bad that what I just put on there needed to be white very, very nearly, and it wasn't white enough. So let, let me pick up another batch. <laughs> uh, I, think I, 
think I can recover. Okay, I think I'll call that good enough. Even though it's got a little more yellow in it than I wanted. The lightest, brightest, whitest color that you can put on your painting. And that ain't it because it got too much yellow in it. But uh, the lightest color you put on, you probably can't see the yellow, is warm white with a palette knife. Because a palette knife leaves a glassy, smooth finish. Brush strokes break up the light. And, and therefore darken the effect. Does, does that make sense to you? Brush strokes, the, the hairs in the brush leave grooves in the paint and that darkens the white paint. But if you use a palette knife, it's a glassy smooth surface, reflects the light the most. So that's the lightest. I'll be, there'll be several little bits. It'll be up here too. There'll be several little areas in the, in the painting that will have um, palette knife white, palette knife light in it. But that's good enough for now. You got to, I think, watch me finish a little area. Let me turn this light off again and, and pick you guys up. Forgive the, the, the uh, bad, the rocky road. Here we go. I'm going to get it pointed in the right direction in a minute. Okay, there we go. Does that look like a shelf full of bottles? Abstract realism. Not super realism, abstract realism, which means the abstract strokes, the abstract elements are more important than the image. Although, obviously, I, th I hope it's obvious that the artist, whoever he was, <laughs> was pretty serious about the image. He definitely wanted the image to show up. And I just saw a few places while I was doing that that I could come in and again, do the same trick light on top of dark. Here, here, here's, a, by the way, a, a, an easy way to remember that. <laughs> I don't know if it's easy, but let me get dramatic so you can remember it. Human beings, <laughs> all human beings, all human beings like to see, we like to see light paint on top of dark paint. We do not like to see dark paint on top of light paint. And I've already given you the, so what do you do then? The answer is, so what do you do is you get dark with transparent and always follow through with, I'm adding just a little bits of red up there. Okay. Whew. Good enough. Thanks for watching. I'll give that, I'll think about that a little bit. Um, th this is the, the one area of the painting that'll have the most opaque on it. From, from here on out, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner.